Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second and final day at the Lymphoma Canada National Conference. For those who may not have met me yesterday, my name is Caitlin Bafislaski, and I'm the Manager of Patient Programs, Research, and Advocacy at Lymphoma Canada. I am pleased to welcome you all to our first educational session of the day, which will focus on how to speak to your family and friends about lymphoma with a special emphasis on speaking with children. We appreciate so many of you joining us online today. One of the most difficult things about getting a lymphoma diagnosis is having to tell people about it. Explaining your diagnosis and the treatment can be very difficult and emotional. So this session will provide you with a bit more information and different ways to speak with family and friends about your lymphoma. There are just a couple of items to note before we get started. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available following the conference. You will receive an email at the time that the recording is available. At the end of this presentation, we'll leave around five minutes or so for a question and answer period. To ask your questions, you can type them into the questions box, which is located in the middle of the black toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to answer as many questions as possible as we can today. There will actually be two speakers for this session. So to start, I will be sharing some introductory information before I switch over the presentation to Lauren to discuss in detail about speaking with lymphoma with your children or grandchildren. I would now like to formally introduce and welcome Lauren. Lauren has been working with the Wellspring Cancer Support Center for about seven years as a program manager. She has a postgraduate degree from McMaster University in child life and has been a certified child life specialist for about 10 years. Lauren focuses on supporting children and families who are affected by cancer. Lauren has actually also co-developed Wellspring's parent and child support program, focusing on effective communication when a family member has been diagnosed with cancer. Lauren is extremely passionate about supporting families and finding creative ways to support people and families living with cancer. So thank you so much, Lauren, for joining us today. I would now like to go ahead and begin with the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the most difficult things about getting a lymphoma diagnosis is having to tell people about it. Cancer can affect the human spirit as much as it affects the body. It can challenge your values, your beliefs, and your goals. It's important to remember that you are not alone. There are many others that are going through similar diagnoses and experiences with you through which you may connect and find support with. There are also many loved ones close to you that want to help you throughout your journey. Having support is an important part of your lymphoma journey. However, to begin to receive support, you first must share your diagnosis with others. Telling people that you have lymphoma and explaining what your treatment journey and clinical course might look like can be very difficult. You need to decide who you want to tell and what you want to tell them. Next slide, please. There are certain things that can help you tell others about your diagnosis. The first step, however, starts with you understanding and accepting your diagnosis. This can sometimes take weeks, uh, days to months. Following your diagnosis, um, many are of course very shocked when they receive this news and some individuals might actually have more time to process in this news compared to others depending on where your lymphoma is at with diagnosis and the requirement for treatment. As such, some people might have more time to share this news with their loved ones in the way they want to rather than being rushed to tell others because their life is completely turned upside down with the need to start treatment right away. No matter what, telling others about your diagnosis is not going to be easy. However, there are different ways to help you prepare. You can first begin by, tell, by learning a bit more about your lymphoma, asking important questions to your medical team, and retrieving Canadian-specific information will help you to set appropriate expectations for your journey, help you to map out your clinical course for a better understanding, and also be prepared to answer some of the questions you might receive from family and friends. You can also talk to your doctor about the treatment options available to you. You can also obtain relevant Canadian specific information from organizations like Lymphoma Canada and Wellspring, or as well from the hospitals and clinics that you're attending that will contain this invaluable information. You can also provide these directly to your loved ones to be able to read on their own time to learn more. You can also, also ask your healthcare team for referrals to different support programs through the hospital that may help you throughout your lymphoma journey and also might help you to speak with your family and friends. Next slide, please. Once you've prepared uh, yourself to begin to tell people, I'll share some guidance on telling different groups of people. 
The first may involve telling your employer or coworkers and employees, especially if you might need to start treatment right away. You might need to take time off work for your treatment. However, it is a personal decision as to whether you want to tell your other colleagues or employees. Your decision might depend on your relationship with your coworkers and employees and the importance of your privacy, your company's corporate culture, and possible previous or past experience with others that may have had an illness in the office. Next slide, please. If you don't know where to begin or are concerned about how your employer will react, try starting with your human resource department or your personal manager. Their experience may support you and guide you through this disclosure process. It may also be a good idea to wait until you know some more details about your treatment schedule before telling those at work. You will then be able to tell them when you will be away and for how long. Also, don't be afraid to ask for the kind of support that you need. For example, you might not want to talk about your lymphoma while at work. You can always ask a trusted colleague to let others know that you'd prefer to focus on your job rather than be discussing this information. Next slide, please. Telling your family and friends is made that much more challenging. There are some suggestions that you might be interested in using when telling your family and friends about your lymphoma diagnosis and your upcoming clinical course. It's best that when you begin to tell people, make it easier for yourself to have a private, quiet conversation, removing any distractions and ensuring that you won't be interrupted. It may be helpful to have someone with you who already knows about your diagnosis if they're available. And it's also important to speak at a level to the individual that you're telling in a way that they will understand. And of course, this is especially important for children, which Lauren will touch on in the next section of this presentation. And some suggestions about how to speak with family and friends include being honest as possible about your feelings. Others may feel the same emotions that you've had. It's okay to cry or yell or be angry. Let them know what to expect during your treatment and what you in turn expect from them. This does not have to be anything tangible and can just include being supportive. Others will likely want to help you. So telling them how they can help is a great way to have a good start to this communication process. Be prepared for difficult questions. Um, it's okay to not have all the answers and you can work together to find out the answers. Encourage your family members to speak to your healthcare team with their questions or concerns. They can either send a list of questions with you or be on the phone with you while you're, while you're going through your appointment to ask their questions. Make sure you give information in small chunks and make sure that the person, person is understanding. This ensures that they are processing the information. Also, don't worry about moments of silence. You may find that holding hands or sitting together quietly is just as important. Next slide, please. With telling your family and friends, part of this conversation will involve an emotional response and it can be difficult to respond to the reactions as everyone may take this news differently. Some will know exactly what to say and do and will be very easy to talk to. They will be very understanding and will be by your side throughout your entire journey providing you with comfort. They will know how to support you over the course of your illness and treatment. Others, on the other hand, may not react in a way that you understand. Some people might withdraw from you, and this can be hurtful. This does not mean that they don't care, but may not be able to deal with the situation. In some of these situations, you may have to accept their response and just remember that you've done nothing wrong. Sometimes people can take a long time to come to terms, or they might want to rush through the process of understanding and dealing with it. You might find it helpful to speak directly and honestly to them about what you're feeling and what you need using any of the methods suggested above. Next slide, please. I would now like to go ahead and turn over the presentation to you, Lauren, to speak more in depth about how to communicate about your lymphoma diagnosis and your treatment course with children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Caitlin. Can you hear me okay? Wonderful. Um, so as Caitlin said, I'm so honored to be here today um, to talk with you all about how to communicate effectively with children and teens when there's been a cancer diagnosis. Um, so the agenda and goals of the presentation, I'm first of all going to talk a little bit about Wellspring, who we are, what we do. Uh, we're going to talk about why we communicate with children and the importance of it. Some of the barriers to communication. How do we start to have um, these conversations with our, our little ones, uh, whether that's a child or a grandchild. Um, the developmental stages of children and appropriate ways to communicate for each developmental stage, 
difficult conversations, and then we're going to talk a little, little bit about some resources as well. So just a quick introduction again, Caitlin already introduced me, but um, I'm a program manager at Wellspring. I'm a certified child life specialist, which means I um, work with children and families on how to support them when there's been some sort of diagnosis. Um, I'm one of the developers of Wellspring's Parent Child Program, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And really my expertise is in cancer communication, supporting um, families, but looking at it from a lens of therapeutic play. So how do we use play how do we use different tools to help to communicate with children? So just a little bit about Wellspring. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Wellspring is a warm, safe and welcoming non-clinical environment. So we don't do any treatment, no medical treatment, but really we're a place where patients can come with any type of cancer at any time in their journey, um, as well as family caregivers and of course children as well. One thing that makes Wellspring very unique is that all of our programs are professionally led. So this means that anybody that's leading a program at Wellspring has at least three to five years of oncology experience and is a paid professional in good standing with their college. All of our programs are uh, supported by volunteers with an expertise in cancer, meaning that if they could have had a cancer experience themselves, they could be a patient, a caregiver, bereaved. Um, so a lot of our programs, like our peer support program, for example, is supported um, by volunteers. And then all of our programs are offered at no cost and uh, Wellspring receives no government or hospital uh, funding. So we do have a number of physical centers um, across Canada, um, a number here in Ontario um, where I'm located, but I know we have people coming from all across the country today. Uh, we do have a few Wellspring locations also in Alberta, um, but today I'm really going to be focusing on our virtual cancer support center. So in fall 2019, we launched our Well on the Web, which is our virtual platform, and this serves a national audience. So we serve uh, patients, caregivers in all provinces and all territories across Canada. So this was kind of part when COVID hit, um, a big part of it was to try and offer this virtual platform so we can offer more services and more programs to people, especially people maybe living in rural communities or um, ones that don't have access to a physical Wellspring space. So Wellspring has over 50 different programs. I'm not gonna go over them all today. We'll talk about some of our family programming in more detail a little bit later. Um, but I'll just briefly touch on kind of some of the types of programs that we do offer uh, through our Well on the Web platform. So our first are interactive group programs. So these are often support groups. So Wellspring has a number of different support groups, one that we um, work with Lymphoma Canada on, our lymphoma support group, um, but we also have caregiver support groups, um, family support groups. So there's a number of different support groups. We have webinars, live presentations. A lot of them are housed right on our Wellspring website. Uh, that talk about things like fear of recurrence, sleep. Uh, there's a number of different topics on there. Uh, individual support by phone. So we recognize that not everybody has access to internet, especially those in rural communities, northern um, territories, things like that. So we do offer individual support by phone for those who want to call in to speak with a peer support volunteer or a number of our programs, you can dial into the program as well. We have self-paced webinars and audio resources housed on our webs, uh, website. So this is recorded content available for consumption at any time. So, you know, if it's the middle of night and you're not able to sleep and you need a meditation to listen to, there's a number of different meditation videos, relaxation videos, yoga videos that are housed right on the website and then downloadable resources. So again, I'm not going to go over um, a lot of our programming today because I know we only have a minimal amount of time, um, but I would encourage you to check out the Wellspring website, um, which will uh, I will give you at the end of the presentation. So today's presentation is really focused on communication with children and teens and what that looks like. So it's really important to ask the question, why do we communicate? Why is it important to talk to children and teens, whether that's your own child, whether that's a grandchild, about cancer? And when we look at the literature, we look at the research, the number one reason we want to do this is it builds trust. And that is so important in a relationship. When we build trust, it means that in future, if there's a future crisis in the family, children know that we can be that we can be trusted and they can come to us. Often children already have a sense that something is going on. So often families will come to me in my own work and say, I haven't told my child yet. I was diagnosed two or three months ago. 
Um, but I have a feeling that they know something. Children are very smart and they do pick up on things. So it could be that you're getting more phone calls than usual. It could be that mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, whoever it may be, might be out of the house more often attending doctor's appointments. There could be literature that's on your table that may have come home from the hospital. So there's so many different clues that kids pick up on. So they really do have a sense that something's happening. So another really important reason why we communicate is Cancer causes interruptions for routine and family dynamics. We know that people can be out of the house more often, attending appointments, chemo. And so for kids, they really operate very egocentric, which means that kids wanna know how something affects them. That's what's really important, especially for some of our younger children, our toddlers, our preschoolers, our school age kids. They're really focused on how does this affect me? And so when there's an interruption to the routine, somebody different taking them to hockey practice or ballet, this can really um, be challenging for children. We also want to communicate because we want to avoid creating more distress for children. So often when we don't tell them about a cancer diagnosis, what happens is there's this idea of catastro or catastrophizing a thought, which means you know if you're not telling them, maybe they think something worse is even happening. And so children start to think about all the really bad things um, that could be happening. And the last reason why we do communicate is because you are the experts. As a parent, as a grandparent, you are really the expert when it comes to cancer. So we really want to be able to provide our children and our teens with accurate and up-to-date information. You know your children, you know your teen better than anybody else in this world. And so it's so important that you're the one that's providing that information because you really are an expert um, in your own cancer journey. So although we know why we should communicate, there's also so many barriers that stop us from communicating with our children. Um, and the number one being that we really want to protect our kids. We want to protect them from any harm. We want to protect them from being sad or angry or scared. Um, and so we often hesitate to talk to our children about a cancer or if it's a grandparent's diagnosis, we're often hesitant to do that. Often it can be really overwhelming to sit down and talk to little kids about cancer when it's so emotional for us, it can be really overwhelming. How do I start that conversation? Am I gonna say the wrong thing during the conversation? There's so many of these thoughts that come into your mind. We also always worry that we're gonna make the feelings worse for children. We'll talk about this a little bit more at the, um, throughout the presentation, but we're worried when we say the word cancer that we're gonna make our children so much more angry or so sad. Um, and so again, we'll kind of address that in a, in a few minutes. Um, we're also worried about the idea of death and dying. One of the first questions that often will come up with kids is, are you going to die from cancer? And this often comes up because children um, throughout Canada are often uh, taught in schools about Terry Fox. So we run a parent-child program here at Wellspring. Um, and on our first week of the program, we always say, what do you know about cancer to the children? And always one of the first things that comes up is Terry Fox had cancer and he died from cancer. So this is often an association that kids make with cancer. But there's ways to work through this. There's ways to have this conversation, which we'll talk about throughout the presentation. We also worry a lot if we're gonna have the right answer. Um, will we know what to say? And sometimes we just don't know where to start. And so really this presentation is about giving you practical advice and strategies about how to start having these conversations with children and teens. So where do we start when it comes to communication? So first we're gonna kind of talk about the who, the what, the where, the when, the why. So the who is, um, I always encourage parents or grandparents, bring in a partner, bring in a parent. If you don't have a partner or a spouse, bring in somebody that feels safe for you, that feels safe for the children. The reason I always encourage more than one person being there um, when you start to have this conversation is if you're feeling overwhelmed with emotion, if you're having a hard time communicating, there's a second person there that can be supporting you and supporting the children. And I think that's really important. When do I have this conversation? When do I tell um, a child about my cancer diagnosis? And I would say, as soon as you know the information in saying that, you know, obviously allow your time yourself some time to process but it's really important as soon as we know we're letting kids know what is happening you know what's the treatment plan what is cancer having those really big conversations and we really want to find a quiet place that feels safe for children so i always encourage parents or grandparents when they're having this conversation find a space that feels safe so that's typically the home um, but it could be a grandparent's home it could be um, an aunt's home whatever place feels safe for them 
I always say try to avoid places in public, like a restaurant or something where kids might feel overwhelmed or not be able to express their emotions or feelings in a safe space. Be really flexible. So often with our little ones, so our toddlers, our preschoolers, um, our school age kids, it is a very, very normal reaction for a kid to take that information in, in five minutes and then say, mommy or grandma, can I go back to playing trains? That is a normal reaction for kids. Kids take a long time to process. There's a lot of big topics that we're talking about when we're talking about cancer. And so take their lead on it. If your kid, if you're finding that your kid or your grandchild um, needs a break, take the break. You can pick up the conversation later that day or tomorrow. Um, if you're finding your, kid, your child is very overwhelmed, stop the conversation. Again, pick it up again tomorrow. So really allow them to take the lead in this conversation. Um, the next one I always say to parents is practice, practice, practice. I know it sounds really funny, but when you have such a conversation that has, um, that, that can be so emotional and really draining for a parent, I say role play it before. Role play with a spouse, with a partner, with a friend, with a social worker, whoever um, feels safe for you and practice what it may feel like saying to your child or to your grandchild, I have cancer, I'm living with cancer because then it helps you to be prepared for some of those questions or some of those feelings or emotions that may happen. Always be truthful. We'll talk about this throughout the presentation, but it is so important to build trust within a relationship to be truthful. We always want to be developmentally appropriate, but truthful, and we'll talk about kind of what that looks like. And don't be afraid to seek support. Having this conversation is not easy. And so if you need support, it is out there for you. There's wonderful resources, places like Wellspring, Lymphoma Canada, there's social workers, counselors out there that can help support you in that conversation. So if you feel you need to meet with them to talk about it, or if you need them present in that conversation, there's so many different supports out there to be able to help you in this process. So how do we communicate? So first of all, what we wanna think of is we always wanna name the cancer. So I really encourage families um, to say the word cancer, although it can be overwhelming. We try and avoid words like sick, unwell. The reason that we try and avoid these words is because often children will associate sick with the common cold or with the flu or with the sore throat that they may have. And so you might say, you know, mom is sick and they think, oh, well, she just has the cold what I, ha what I had last week. Or opposite is that next time the child gets sick, they could think, wow, I have, I have what mom has. So we really want to try and name the word cancer. Next, I always encourage uh, parents to talk about the place in the body that it could happen or where the, the cancer is present. Uh, talk about the treatment plan. So uh, saying, you know, mom or grandma or grandpa, whoever it may be, dad um, is going to have something called chemo. Uh, chemo is a medication they're going to give me to help fight the cancer. And we can talk a little bit more about some, you know, child friendly ways to talk about chemo. Um, but the treatment plan is really helpful for kids to know, you know, what are we now doing about the cancer and what will change? Again, this goes back to this idea that children are very egocentric and they want to know how does this affect my world? How does this affect my life? And so talking about things, you know, mom's going to be off work. Uh, dad's going to be picking me up more often. Um, dad might not be able to play with me as often as he could. So talking about all these things that possibly could look different for a child. We need developmentally appropriate ways to communicate. So one of the first things that always comes up, and I call them kind of the three C's, is the cause, the catch, and the care. So children will often think that they cause cancer. Um, you know, I didn't put my toys away last week, so I think I caused mom to have cancer. I hit my sister, I caused the cancer. And even teens and adolescents can, say, can think the same thing. So it's really important in that conversation to address that. There's nothing you have done that caused cancer. We actually don't know why cancer happens. For some of our older kids, I'll often talk about risk factors, but for most people, we don't know why they get cancer. So there's nothing that you've done. There's nothing that mom did, dad did, grandma did, grandpa did that caused this cancer. The next that we typically see this in our younger kids is the catch. Can I catch cancer? So children often think, like the common cold, um, that you can catch cancer. So we like to reiterate this idea that you, you can't catch it. We can still hug, we can still kiss, we can still play, we can still snuggle in bed. All these things that we normally do as a family, um, we can still do. You cannot catch cancer. And who will care for me? So often when children think about this idea that 
you know, if dad has cancer, he might not be around as much because he has treatment. Well, who's going to take me to hockey on Saturday morning or who's going to care for me when dad's not there? So it's really important to express to children, there will always be somebody here. There will be a grandparent here, a neighbor here helping out. There will always be somebody to pick you up from school. I'm really uh, reiterating that for children is really important. So how do we first start this conversation? Um, one thing that I like to say to families is um, once you've kind of sat down, you found a quiet and safe space, uh, safe space for children is, you know, we want to talk to you today about mom. She has something called cancer. Can you tell me what you know about cancer? This is a great opening question because it helps kind of debunk some of the myths that kids may have. So, you know, a kid might right away say, I know that Terry Fox died from cancer. And you can address that and say, yes, he did die from cancer. And some people do die from cancer. But the doctors and the nurses and the people on our healthcare team have all this medication and these treatment plans, and they don't think that mommy or daddy is going to die from cancer. They're having lots, they're doing lots of different things um, to ensure that we um, beat this cancer. So you can have conversations like that. Um, check in throughout the conversation. Again, this idea that kids can feel overwhelmed. So check in and say, you know, how's it going? Would you like to stop the conversation now? Are you okay? Do you need anything? Should we have a break? Check in throughout. Check in if they're understanding, get them to explain back. That's another great tool. You know, I might say, after I've explained kind of what the cancer is, I might say to a child, so if you met another child, how would you explain cancer to them? To really see if they understood what we're, what we're talking about or what we're saying. And this doesn't need to happen in the first conversation. This could happen a week later, two weeks later, whenever it works for you and for the child. Always in, um, let kids know that you're going to continue to keep them informed. So if things change, if my diagnosis changes, if uh, medical information changes, treatment plans change, I will keep you informed. And it's okay to say, I don't know. We don't know the question, the answers to everything. I don't, um, you don't, we just don't know the answers to everything. So it's okay to say to a child, you know, either I don't know, I'll find out for you, or I don't know, you know, let's think about that together. So next we're going to talk about a few developmental stages. Um, some of the reactions uh, that kids in specific developmental stages could have. So our toddler and preschoolers. So typically have a very minimal understanding of cancer. However, I still think it's really important to let this age group know about cancer, still saying the word cancer, letting them know they didn't cause it, letting them know they didn't catch it. At this age, toddlers and preschoolers are really focused on side effects. Again, this idea of how does my world look different? So for really young kids, it could be if you've lost your hair from chemo, they could say, you know, that's really important for them to know. Um, is mom going to be tired or dad going to be tired or is grandma not going to be able to come over as much? So really focus on some of those side effects with kids. You will definitely see seeking more play, more snuggles, more attention from parents. And that is a completely normal reaction to a cancer diagnosis. You will possibly see them regress. Um, so for kids, this could be they start wetting the bed, they might go back to baby talk, they might ask for a soother again. Um, and regression, again, is a completely way, a normal way to respond to a diagnosis. You might see them acting out, um, increased tantrums. So what can we do to help our toddler and preschool age kids? We want to reframe what playtime looks like. So um, a great example of that would be, you know, you come home from uh, treatment, you're really tired after chemo, and your child says, can we play baseball outside? You know, let's reframe what that would look like. You know, you're not up for playing baseball, but could you say to your child, you know, mom or dad isn't up for playing baseball right now, but could we snuggle in my bed together and watch a movie? Could mom watch you from inside the window while she takes a little bit of a rest for you to play baseball? There's so many other ways to reframe what playtime looks like for children, um, especially for our toddlers and our preschools. Preschoolers. Um, use play and books to talk about cancer. We'll talk about a few resources at the end of the presentation that, um, that are cancer specific, but use play. Get a doctor's kit, a nurse's kit, um, and talk about, you know, you look at some of those um, uh, play things that would be, uh, that would help involve children in um, a cancer diagnosis and to help them understand and create routine. And this is really important um, with our toddlers, our preschool, and our age our school-aged children um, to create routine because it's predictable and that's really what they crave. Next is our school-aged children. Uh, so they have a minimal understanding um, and may understand kind of the core concepts of cancer. But what you may see is again, acting out, increased anxiety, separation anxiety, but the big one here is embarrassment. I hear this a lot from children um, who will say to me, I had a child once say to me, 
I want my mom's cancer to go away because I'm so embarrassed she shows up and has no hair. And so for children, it's often about their peers. It's often how, you know, a parent or a grandparent may appear to their peers. And so there could be a lot of embarrassment around that. There could be challenges at school. Again, these are all very completely reactions um, that a child may have from a diagnosis. So what can we do to help our school age children? Create opportunities for them to be involved in your care. This is all about control for them. It's about this idea of autonomy. So um, an, uh, an example would be for them to be involved, you know, if you're having, you have really cold feet, you say, you know, could you help get a pair of socks out of the drawer? Um, it's really cold. Or if you were ever um, admitted to a hospital, could you color me some pictures to help decorate my room? There's so many ways that they can be involved in your care to help feel like they're involved in staying informed. Um, within a cancer diagnosis. Again, this idea of creating routine, reassuring them that, you know, you had hockey every Saturday, you had ballet every Saturday, you know, you will continue to do that. It might not be mom or dad who will take you, it could be a neighbor, it could be a friend, somebody else, but really reassuring them that that routine will continue. And check in often to see how they're doing. Check in about feelings, because um, it's so important to be able to address those feelings. And then last but not least is our adolescents and our teenagers. Um, so often we'll see increased anxiety, wanting to take on this idea of being a parent, so this role of a parent. So teenagers have also often said to me, I feel pressure like I've become a parent, especially if there's younger siblings involved. Um, there could be sleep disturbances, so having a hard time falling asleep or being even more tired. Um, for some teens, it's just shutting down, not wanting to talk about it, or showing no interest in activities, so something that they may have really loved before. Maybe they're not showing interest in activities. Again, really normal reactions to a diagnosis. But what can we do to help our adolescents? Open communication is key with this group. You know, they're really young adults, um, and so they really want to be informed throughout the diagnosis, having conversations about what's happening, treating them like they are, you know, teenagers and not little children, and encouraging them to be a kid. So this is such an important point. You know, it saying to a teenager or an adolescent, it is not your job to be a parent. So it's not your job to cook dinner every night. It's not your job to discipline your siblings. That is not your job. Your job is to be a kid. Um, and although encouraging them still to help out around the house and be involved in you know, your care, but also not having to take on that parenting role because it really relieves a lot of pressure from adolescents. Allow them opportunities for expression, um, especially expression with their, their uh, peers. And don't be afraid to express your own feelings, which we'll address in just a few moments. So difficult conversations. So often, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, children or teens will, the first question they'll ask is, are you going to die from cancer? And this can be a really, really difficult question to hear um, as a parent, as a grandparent. Um, and so what I would encourage you to do is always be truthful. The truth is, is that we don't know, we never know. Um, however, talk to them about what we do know. We do know that the doctors and the nurses and your medical staff is doing everything they can. We do know that the chemo is working really well. We do know um, that the, the cancer is slowly shrinking. So we can talk about all those things that we know, but always being developmentally appropriate. Um, never promise anything. Never promise, you know, I promise my cancer is gonna go away in a month, because again, you don't know. Um, it could take a little bit longer than that. So. Um, try and never promise anything because, again, we really want to create that trust with our teens and our children. And then creating opportunities for hope. Um, so for, for parents or grandparents who have been diagnosed with an advanced um, diagnosis, it is important to create opportunities for hope. And so this could be hope for more time. This could be hope for a clinical trial, hope for different types of treatments. So there's always a way to reframe hope for children and teens. And then keep them updated as you know more. Again, this idea of keeping them in the loop at all times about, you know, when a prognosis may change or medical um, treatment may change. And keep communicating. And that's really the key um, to check in often with kids and to see how they're doing. Let the school and other important people and places know. Um, the school is often one of the first places that we see children maybe regress or struggle. And so it's important for them to have somebody safe at the school that knows what's happening in the home, that if they do see something, they can have it be having a conversation with you. This is also really helpful. You know, if the principal or teacher knows that 
if your child's having kind of an off day, or at least an angry day, they know why, they know what's happening, so they're best able to support them. Uh, like I said, update children when there's a change in treatment or medical uh, advice, prognosis. And then this is such an important point. It's okay to not be okay. I encourage parents to show their feelings. Um, you know, sometimes parents will say to me, I don't want to cry in front of my child. And what I say to them is your child is already sad, but when you express that sadness with them, they're able to sit in that emotion with you. What you're telling your child or what you're telling your teen is it is okay to express that emotion. It's a healthy emotion. It's okay to feel sad about a cancer diagnosis, but also allow all feelings. You know, it's okay to be sad, it's okay to be angry, but it's okay to be happy as well. I'll, I'll tell you just a really quick story. We, I worked with a child um, a few years ago and um, he said to me, I'm so happy my mom had, has cancer and all the other kids in the room were just, they couldn't believe what this child was saying. And for that child, it meant that mom, who was kind of a workaholic before the diagnosis, was home all the time. And for that child, that felt so safe and that felt so happy. And so we talked about that with the parent. We talked about that with the parent. We talked about that with the child saying, that's okay to feel happy. Um, it's okay to have moments where you're just playing and feeling happy. We don't have to be sad all the time about a cancer diagnosis. Because really at the end of the day, kids job and teens job is to be a kid, to be a teen. And so we'll talk about a few resources and activities you can do with your children and teens that specifically relate to feelings. So next we're gonna move on to some resources, resources um, that are accessible to you. So the first are our Wellspring resources. So if um, you're looking for some support, whether that's a parent, a caregiver, a grandparent who has been diagnosed with cancer, we have a few different resources at Wellspring. The first is a downloadable resource. Um, I am happy to send it to anybody. Uh, my email will be on the last slide. Um, and it's a resource that really talks about what I've spoken about today, about how to support your child um, when there's been a cancer diagnosis, you know, some of those developmental things to look out for, ways to start that conversation. So it's a great tool. We have one uh, for parents. We also have a specific downloadable resource for people living with an advanced cancer. Um, we also have family counseling available at Wellspring. So our counseling is available on a short-term basis, um, but if you're looking for support about how to have these conversations, how to talk to kids, if you're looking just for parenting support overall when there's been a cancer diagnosis, we have family counselors available um, that can meet with you either over the over Zoom, over the phone, uh, to talk to you um, about putting more tools in your toolbox. How can we equip you with the right tools? What coping skills can we provide for you? Um, again, my email will be um, posted uh, in a few slides, so feel free to reach out to me if you're looking for that support. Um, we have a children and parents virtual program. So this is a support group for parents and for children. And when I say parents, it's also um, available for caregivers. So if you're a grandparent and you are you know, highly involved in your granddaughter um, or son's care, um, this program would absolutely be available for you as well. And it's a six week program, virtual program, um, that helps kids understand what is cancer and some of the feelings that we have around cancer. It uses a lot of therapeutic play and tools for kids to understand that. But a big part of this program is to normalize the cancer experience for them to meet other kids who might have a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa um, who has cancer as well. And then within that program, there's also a portion, um, a support group for the parents as well. And then last but not least is our Oasis Parent Group, which is a parent uh, support group specifically for a parent, um, for a parent with an advanced or metastatic diagnosis. Um, they meet twice a month um, to get information, share, and support each other, and that's a professionally-led program. So I'm just going to talk about two quick uh, therapeutic activities um, that I've used in my own practice um, that I think are great tools for a caregiver, a parent, grandparent to use. So the first is a worry box. So we often know kids have a lot of worries, um, whether that's a worry about cancer or anything else about school, anything. So I encourage parents to find a box. It could be a Tupperware container. It could be a wooden box at a dollar store, a shoe box, whatever it is, and have your child or your teen decorate it. So as you can see, this little girl here decorated hers um, and encourage kids to put their worries in it. Um, this allows for them to kind of release their worries. So I often will say to parents, have your children put it by the bedside 
uh, table if they can't sleep one night, you know, grab a pen, grab a piece of paper, write down your worries, put it in the box. There's two ways to utilize this box. And one way is to have, you know, a family worry box where maybe once a month, once a week, you open up that box and you go through all the worries together. And this is a great way to debunk some of those myths. And, you know, maybe it might be a worry that I'm worried that I did something that caused mom to have cancer. And so you can say there's nothing you did. So it's a great way to continue that communication with children. It also creates family unity. You know, if your child wants to create a worry box and you yourself want to create one, um, it's a great conversation starter. But also allow the worry box to be a safe spot if they don't want to share. You know, saying to a child, if you want this worry box to be something that you just write down your worries, that just releases them or kind of takes that weight off their shoulders, that's an okay tool as well. So that's a great activity you can do. And then the second activity is the feelings wheel. I love this um, activity. And so what you do, you get a piece of paper, cardboard, wherever you can find, um, and create a big, large um, circle, almost like a pizza or a pie. And what I get families to do is to say to your child, when you think about cancer, when you think about mom or dad's diagnosis, whoever it may be in your family that has um, cancer, I want you to think about all the feelings that you have in your body. And what I start by doing is get them to label some of those feelings. So let's just shout them out. You know, it could be fear, it could be anger, sadness, happiness. Um, and then what I have them do is divide their pie or their pizza up to how much in their body they feel that. And it's such a great way to normalize the feeling. So a child may put half their pie as anger and the other half is sadness. And you can really normalize that feeling by saying to them, you know what? I feel in my body, I'm really sad too, or I get angry too. And then coming up with strategies to release some of that anger or talk about some of that sadness. Um, so again, a great communication tool for, for parents and caregivers. Uh, so here are a few books and websites. Um, the Invisible String is a wonderful book. I always recommend. It's not cancer specific, um, but it's really a great tool for um, children. It's this idea that we're all attached by this invisible string. So that parents to a child or grandparent are attached for an invisible string. So if you're physically not there, so let's just say you get admitted to the hospital or you are away at chemo every Monday or radiation, whatever it may be, um, this idea that you're still connected to your child. And so this is a great tool to use, you know, not only for a cancer diagnosis, but for parents who have separation or divorce. So that's a great um, book. Cancer Hates Kisses is a wonderful children's book um, about a mom who has cancer and who um, the children view as her superhero. Uh, the Way I Feel, again, not cancer specific, but a great feelings book to start talking about some of these big feelings that we may have. So it helps kind of label these feelings that children may have, because often the hardest part about feelings and emotions with kids is they can't label them. They feel something in their body, but they can't label it. So feelings books are a great tool to put in your child's um, library. My, kids, my parent has cancer, it really sucks. This is a, a book for uh, our teen population. And then the last um, is a website, kidshealth.org. Kidshealth.org, if you haven't been there, <clears throat> it's a great tool to explain cancer, lymphoma, um, really any sort of diagnosis. There's things on asthma, diabetes. There's so much on kids' health that if you have questions about um, something medical related, um, whether it's cancer specific or not, kids' health is a great um, tool for you to check out. And then last, just not, uh, last but not least, just how to access programs. Like I said before, um, if you're interested in support through Wellspring, um, visit wellspring.ca, um, everything on there. Um, all our programs are on there and services. There's a membership form you can fill out. Again, everything's free of charge. Or also I would encourage you to go to Lymphoma Canada. Again, a number of wonderful education support programs available. Also uh, lymphoma.ca for more information. Um, Thank you all for, uh, I want to specifically thank Caitlin and Lymphoma Canada for allowing me to be here and allowing me to chat with you today. Um, if you have questions, my email is there. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions about how to support your child or grandchild or you're looking for other supports. You know, I'm always, my door, my virtual door is always open and I'm more than happy to support families the best way I know how. So thank you again for having me.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lauren, for providing this valuable information and resources for how to start to tell your family and friends and especially young children or grandchildren about your lymphoma in a way that's best for you and for the child. So I'd just like to now open the Q&A. I think we have about five minutes. Um, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A section and we'll go ahead and get started with answering them. And we do have a couple of questions to start. Uh, Lauren, these are actually more so directed to you. Sure. Um, so I think you touched on this briefly. Um, so the first question is, what do I do when my child starts to become quiet or isolate themselves or on the other hand, starts to act out more? Could this just be related to them knowing about their diagnosis and what can you as a parent or a grandparent do to help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of those um, things that you named are very normal reactions to cancer. Um, so, you know, acting out, being really quiet, um, kids take a long time to process. Um, and so what I would encourage you to do is check in with your child. Again, a lot of times it's they just don't know how to express the feeling. They don't know how to label that feeling. So I would start with something simple, like one of the therapeutic activities we talked about today by saying, you know, I like to tell, you know, if I was the one living with cancer, I might say, you know, I feel really sad some days that I have cancer. I feel really angry some days, you know, and these are the things that I do to help with those things and come up with really practical things. I like to go for a run. Sometimes I'll say to kids, let's punch a pillow together to really get that anger out. So really checking in with kids and then providing them coping skills or tools um, to release that um, and to help them, you know, identify kind of what's going on in their body, because that's often what it is. They don't know how to regulate those feelings. They don't know how to label those feelings. Thank you so much. Um, the next question we have is more so related to some specific resources for partners or spouses, especially for those who have already lost a partner or family member to cancer. Um, mm -hmm. Wanted to know if Wellspring has these types of, um, you know, informational resources, uh, I guess more so on, on that kind of adult side as well. Sure. Yeah, so absolutely. Wellspring definitely has um, a number of resources for um, a parent, caregiver, grandparent who, is, who has died from cancer. So we do have um, a bereavement support group at Wellspring. We also do have a resource um, on our website that talks about some practical um, tools and how to support your children in grief. Um, if you want to specifically email me, I'm happy to provide you with a few other uh, resources. I know here um, in the GTA, uh, there's a great organization called Lighthouse. They do a lot of wonderful um, work um, with children when they're grieving a parent or, or caregiver. Um, so I'd be happy to provide you with more grieving resources. There's also um, some great books out there. Um, when Dinosaurs Die is a great one that talks about some really practical ways of what you know death means and what it looks like for children. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, the next question we have, um, is uh, how long would you recommend waiting before telling, um, you know, a loved one, including your children about your diagnosis? Um, you know, would you wait until you have all the information available um, mm -hmm. or would you try to, you know, tell them as soon as, as soon as you find out so that they can kind of understand what's gonna start happening or, you know, if they might see, like you mentioned, those, those pamphlets that you received from the doctor's mm -hmm. office. So it's really what it feels best for you, but I would say the sooner the better. So even if you don't have a treatment plan, you know, give your time yourself some time to process it because you never want to tell your child and them they're comforting you because you're still working through a few things. Um, but I think it's um, absolutely fine before you have a treatment plan to talk to children because you can always say, you know, mom or dad or whoever it may be has been diagnosed with cancer. This is the type of cancer. You know, the doctors are going to, they're coming up with a treatment plan. So we don't know what that's going to look like. We'll probably know in the next week or two, and then we'll connect back again to talk about what that treatment plan is. I think that's totally okay for kids. Um, I think the kids appreciate having that information earlier than later. It's always better to do it before they kind of find out themselves or start to pick up on something. So as soon as you kind of have that information, you're feeling safe um and you're feeling ready uh to tell them i would say as soon as you can the better perfect thank you so much lauren 